Hi, this is Dr. Carl Goldcamp. If you're interested in learning about the ketogenic diet like I was, to save my own life, then this is probably the podcast for you. Eight years ago, I knew nothing about it. Six years ago, it saved my life. Three years ago, I started researching and talking with some of the authorities in the field and attending medical conferences about this to understand why and how keto so dramatically changed my and my wife's Judy's lives. The purpose of this podcast is to share our journey of discoveries with you in understanding how keto is so effective in proving so many different conditions from obesity, epilepsy, diabetes, infertility, MS, Alzheimer's, heart disease, to name a few. So take a step away from all the hype you've probably heard and roll up your sleeves with me and join me weekly to explore this living miracle that anyone can access. We'll talk science, we'll talk food. We'll explore its history and evolution to today, which is that the sheer wonder of the ketogenic way of eating has changed untold number of lives, unlike anything before it. And in case I forget to mention it, please join our Facebook group, Keto Naturopath. Hi, this is Dr. Carl Goldcamp, and welcome back to another episode of The Keto Naturopath. Today, I'm doing a prequel to a two- or three-part interview with somebody whose career has focused on dealing with processed food addictions. That's Joan Iflin. Today's discussion, which is me, will be talking about a little background to processed food and the idea of addiction. The whole topic of addiction is far bigger than anything I'm going to touch on now. I'm going to probably oversimplify it, but I would uh, remind you of the interview, a couple parts, the two or three parts I did with Dr. Christopher Palmer, a psychiatrist who is applying a ketogenic diet to various behavioral um, disorders. Yeah, the first part of that podcast, we did talk about addiction, and uh, we talked about some of the pathways, some of the neurotransmitters that are stimulated by this and why addiction, the level of addiction and using the word addiction really brings it to a whole different order. So coming from the field of addiction, not me personally, but I'm saying collectively, coming from that perspective and now looking at, well, what are the things in life are addictive? And so what does addiction mean? Basically, addiction means that you have such a drive to want to do more of that particular behavior that you can't control your own behavior. It's that strong. And uh, you are aware of it, but it's beyond your ability to pull it back. So that's kind of the, the layman's understanding of addiction. So certainly food addiction falls into that. Certainly drug addiction falls into that, whether it's heroin, cocaine, name your drugs. But what is interesting, and I, I want to kind of set the foundation for every podcast that I do, it has to be relevant to the ketogenic diet. You know, how is this topic we're going into processed foods and addiction relevant to the ketogenic diet? Well, as a step one basis to start with the ketogenic diet, we tend to talk about macros, you know, drop your carbs and increase your fat and keep your protein moderate. I think we've mentioned that a number of times. That's sort of like, all right, that's the beginning. And if that's all there was to it, and if there was no such thing as processed foods, and it was it was all whole foods, it was either you ate it directly from the ground, if you're, you know, you picked your own lettuce and vegetables, to the degree you had a salad, and that would be the sum total of your carbs, and the, your meat would be out in the backyard, you're still grazing, or it's in the freezer because you've uh, taken it to be slaughtered, and now you have your steaks and your organs and so on and so forth. Well, we've evolved away from that. Few people grow their own foods. Few people, you know, whether it's livestock or or vegetables. And even if it was just you not doing this, few people have that in their diet. In other words, the diet is no longer just veggies and various types of meat or fish or shellfish and so on and so forth. It's going to the grocery store and it's getting the packaged food it's getting maybe a better step would be packaged foods that's frozen, but it's certainly not whole foods. Whole foods are basically minimally touched by hands. They're not mechanically reduced to anything. Okay, so what happens now is with these processed foods, 
is that there's a whole science behind it. So the whole science is adding specific, specific flavors that we like, and technically there's five flavors. Uh, most, the, the most driving one is sweets. Then you have salt. Then you have fats in general, which is not a flavor, but fats is something we crave. And so if you just dealt with those three things, salt, sweet, and fat, you'd be able to, and really concentrate it, you would be the beginning of making an addictive food. That's, again, a simplistic sort of understanding of what food addiction is, and now goes way beyond it. Some pretty sophisticated chemicals that are now put into processed foods. So that would be you know, breakfast, anything that comes in a package for the most part is a processed food. And the reason I'm sort of going to perseverate on this point and sort of approach it from so many different angles is because I made a number of mistakes over my time in working with patients way back, starting when I first became a, you know, my own practice or working in another practice back in the late 19, <laughs> late 1900s, 1999 and forward. And so when you look at people's diet, well, back then I was trying to get people off of processed food and I didn't really identify it as that. I was just trying to, and I said, you know, have it from earth to you is the way I left it. Pretty good definition, eh? But I wasn't thinking that articulately of saying, hey, it's a processed food and don't do processed foods. You know, it was very easy to say, hey, shop around the perimeter of the grocery store. Well, that's no longer the true because you go to the checkout and you got all the garbage up there and there's all these places. So they got you one way or the other. So the idea of getting people away from processed food is a pretty simplistic and it's very effective. However, the ability to help people move away from processed foods to the whole foods it's not that simple. It's not saying, hey, I'm going to point to your diet, the things that you should not be eating, and please don't have them anymore. It's really me now, the practitioner, me, Dr. Carl Goldcamp, not understanding that those were in essence drugs encapsulated or impackaged, if that's a word, to these various foods. And so they were lining up and getting their various drugs for the week in addition to their healthier foods. And so they took their drugs home with them the processed foods home with them. And it was an addiction in which they went home and they had that, you know, uh, special, my mother used to do this, hoard, hoard away those special foods, whether they're the potato chips or the flavored almonds or the Pepperidge Farm cookies. You know, they were so refined and added with flavor. It was more than just a reward. And so to go into the, the, neurotransmitter side of thing. It's dopaminergic. It's it's the pleasure principle. It's the same release you get with, with sex. It's the same release you get with any particular cocaine and heroin. It's the dopamine. It makes you feel good. It makes you feel extraordinarily loving in a way. If you've ever been on a, a pain med, but too much of that obviously causes a problem. What they're finding now is that carbohydrates in general, we don't have to say sugar, Carbohydrates in general are addictive. In fact, carbohydrates are even more addictive than heroin and crack. And they've done studies on this. There's not miles of studies, but there's enough studies to do the comparison. And primarily, they're, they're on mice. They're not on humans. You can't do these kind of studies on humans. That'd be more of a retrospective sort of um, conclusion to draw. And so this is just carbohydrates. And then within the family of carbohydrates, of course, are the refined carbohydrates, the sugars, and so on. So we have these foods that are in our diet that are extraordinarily addictive, primarily because they were never concentrated as they can be concentrated now. Okay, so now that you know that, for some of you, that might be helpful. But for others of you, it's not helpful. That's a little bit like saying, hey, fella, I wouldn't be doing crack cocaine because it's addictive. He'll look up to you and say, you know, duh, of course. I love it. It is addictive. I love feeling good. So therein is the problem. It's knowing, but it's implementing. How do you pull somebody across that? And most of us are actually very addictive to these processed foods. So on the level of addiction... Once you have that pathway created, I eat this bag, I get a certain reaction, bag of stuff, I get this certain reaction, and I can identify that, call it potato chips, whatever. And I have that so ingrained 
that when I see that, the visual cue, cue now is as dramatic as eating it. It's that anticipation. It's like, oh, I bought this bag. I'm going to take it home and I'm going to have it at home. A lot of people can't wait to have it at home. They buy it. They've been visually stimulated and it starts it going, then I want it now. So by the time they get into the car, they rip open the bag and they start having it the whole way home. So you can say that for a number of things. You can say that certainly for chocolates. You can say that for, you know, name your favorite thing. And I would challenge you to think of when you see it, what's your response? When you hear it, so for others, it could be beer. It could be the, the, the effervescence of the beer. For those who are the beer aficionados, it's not so much you're an aficionado, but it's you, you crave that taste and you hear that and you see the bottle and, uh, or you see the glass on the bar or wherever you might see this. And it's all very exciting. It's all very anticipatory. You are generating dopamine right there and then. And then you go to habit. And it gets even higher. So for some, these, you know, talking about it and giving a audible understanding about this is even a trigger. You know, for some of you, you mentally went into the grocery store, bought those chips or whatever it is, or those special cookies, and you couldn't wait to get through the checkout line and you're now sitting in your car and you open that package and you're eating it right there mentally while you're listening to me. So this is actually a big, big deal. So this this behavior really didn't exist in the kind of cultural intensity that we're having right now before the 1980s, 1970s. And before that, we can say there was, you know, the revolution, the uh, industrial revolution sort of brought it to a certain level, but it wasn't until you got to the industrialization of food post-World War II. And then in the 80s, as Joan Iflin will talk about, is that you had the tobacco companies that were giving up on their tobacco. I mean, the days for trying to defend tobacco as being a safe thing to do were pretty much over. And so what they did, they went out and they bought the uh, food companies, processed food companies. And by the end of the 80s, they owned over 10% of the processed food companies. And so what they did is they brought their technology into food making, like they did with cigarettes. If you thought people were smoking cigarettes and it was just tobacco, you know, no, it wasn't just tobacco. It was, oh, 50 to 150 different substances were in the cigarettes. They're like special recipe. And so they bought special recipe to make the food addictive as it was addictive with cigarettes. And some of you are saying, well, wait a minute, cigarettes was about nicotine. That's partially, yeah, nicotine is addictive, but they just plugged it away for everything else. And the marketing for addictive things, such as cigarettes or alcohol and so on and so forth, became more clever. You know, what age groups to market to, how to market to them, uh, get them hooked earlier. So it's it's the same old, same old with addiction. So whether you're, a, you're selling crack on the street corner or you're selling processed food via cartoons to children ages two to eight, watching cartoons used to be on Saturday morning. Now it's anytime they want to watch it. They know how to impregnate those, those programs with visual stimulus to get those kids to go out and buy and harangue their parents to buy those things. And after that, it's Captain Crunch for life. It's Fruit Loops for life. It's chocolate bars for life because their parents now have 10 times the job they had to do 60 years ago to say, no, we're not doing this, Johnny. We're just not doing it. He'll throw a fit and you have to deal with it. Former generations did not have to deal with the drug addiction aspect of food in their children. So it's become, I won't say a torture, but it's become extremely difficult to parent for many reasons today, but that's just one. So it's the advertising it's the intensity of the foods. So now as adults, back to just the sort of generic and individual, they have a lot of visual cues that that's part of self-awareness. I mean, there, there are 12-step programs for food addiction out there to be able to walk away from, just like this 12-step program for alcoholism and, and uh, drug addictions and so on and so forth. So, but what is the 12-step program? The 12-step program is... I hate to oversimplify it, but it's really generating 
a self-awareness of saying, gosh, I actually do love this thing. We call it love. It's a real more, a more affectionate, don't you think? Instead of saying I'm addicted, I, I love this thing. So this thing that you love, that you have stashed away in various places, um, is, is really a biochemical process that kicks up your dopamine and makes you feel good. And that process starts when you saw it in the store, you brought it home, you stored it in the cupboard, you know where they are, or in the cookie jar, wherever you put these things. And, and now it's no different than the attic that has his stash of stuff. You know, and I would challenge you, and here's, here's the truth of it all. I would challenge you of when you look at what are the things you really love, and now we're talking about food only. What are the things you really love in food? And I would argue probably 90% of all these things you're going to choose are going to be processed foods. Okay. So you're saying you're just doing this little mental journey with me uh, to humor me. Okay. Now you're going to say you have your little list of those things. Let me say, don't have them for a month. What's your reaction right now? Absolutely. What is your reaction right now? You're going to say, uh, uh, first of all, it's not killing me. You know, I'm not unhealthy. You're going to begin justifying why you should have it. And I'm not here to take that justification away from you. I'm here just to point out that you have a strong attachment to that thing that you're unwilling to give out. You know, uh, casein, dairy falls into that. How many people love cheese? They love cheese. And and uh, even in the keto world, they go, oh, cheese, cheese is like the perfect keto food. It's addictive, man. And it's a great story of why it's addictive. And that's a whole different route. You know, that's a natural food, but it's a concentrated dairy product. Love cheese, love cheese. And there's a lot of issues with dairy. Um, I don't have dairy, but we have every so often, you'll have a treat, you know, so you'll, or it's out in some social occasion. So I'm not phobic about it, but we don't have it. We have a, you know, maybe we'll make a special blue cheese sauce for some of the meats. You know, that's once in a rare, rare time. But the point is, you love it and you know you love it. Maybe not everybody. And when I couple that with, can you give it up for a month or two? You immediately go on to justify why it's not a big deal in your life and you don't want to do what I just suggested. So to me, that's evidence that you're addicted. Back to the Chris Palmer interview. You remember he used the words... And there is a lot of academic research around addiction, addiction in general, and that it hijacks, to use this word, it hijacks your brain. And this is really interesting. Okay. So the, not to get into cerebral, um, brain anatomy or uh, neurotransmitters, but generally we consider the frontal cortex right, below, right behind your forehead is kind of the thinking, the thinking part thinking in the sense of conscious thinking, you're weighing out choices, you're, you're, you're looking at the nuanced difference from choice A to choice B, you're conscious, it's, it's full conscious, you're making a conscious decision. Do I go do this thing or do I not go do this thing? You know, that's where that thinking goes on. So when the expression is addiction hijacks your brain, it means... <laughs> No blood goes to that part of the brain. We're not having thinking about this decision anymore. Hey, buddy. Hey, buddy. No, we're not thinking. We're doing. So we go right to the doing part of the brain. So the doing part of the brain is a dopaminergic. You know, it starts to squirt out, starts to manufacture, starts to secrete, however you want to look at it. Dopamine in your eyes starting to get that rush, that anticipatory rush, whatever it is. And you can't turn that off. There was, and how they know this, by the way, is because they do... Uh, scans. They do uh, when glucose is up, taken, and, uh, taken up in the various parts of the brain. They call that a PET scan, and that part of the brain lights up. And uh, what a neat, what a neat uh, analysis, by the way, just to have that. And that's only been around since I think the '80s. PET scans, uh, maybe the late '70s. Uh, Nora Volkov, uh, who was mentioned also on that podcast, she's the one who educated in Mexico, and she's now working for the NIH on addiction. And uh, is apparently going to be doing some work with uh, a ketogenic diet and addiction as well. That's pretty exciting. But when she graduated, the PET scans were just coming out. It was the new tool. And so she decided to look at PET scan of, of addiction. 
And so she'd look out what parts of the brain would light up when they would show certain images of various foods and so on and so forth and you know other activities, what happens when one eats. And so it was found that no, the frontal cortex, your thinking part of the brain doesn't, you know, is not so much not lit up, it's shut off. You know, the drawbridge is pulled up. We're not going to thinking. We're going to immediately feeling good and you want more of that. So um you know, there's a survival technique. There's, there's the reason that reflex of going dopaminergic is is a survival technique. If you technique uh, development, it is for our survival. Evolved that way. If you go back a thousand or two thousand years and said, you know, you should you should look for meat and fruit and you know these things that are going to sustain you in life and feel good about it. You know, so. There's there's the mastodon. I have to go kill it. There's some fruits out there. I'm going to go eat it for a calorie. There's some clams. There's some whatever. I mean, you have that anticipatory. Let's go get some because we're hungry. Well, now it's gone far beyond that, of course. And so the hijacking is the turning off of your thinking part of the brain, the frontal cortex, and turning on simply the addictive pathways. So and in that, it gets pretty complicated. It gets into visual. Uh, Joan will go into this much more than myself, but I'll leave it at that. There is an addictive pathway. It clearly turns it on. Carbohydrates in general are addictive. So some people are saying, oh, that's nonsense. I'm just a vegetarian and I just have vegetables. I'm not addicted to my vegetables. What can I say to that? You know, um, I would propose the same sort of question. Can you go without it for so long? Oh, no. Um, so also there is, it's been in the news fairly frequently in the last couple of months and NPR did a nice article on this basically showing in their version, the difference between a processed food meal and a non-processed food meal. And then there was a study and they called ultra processed diets cause excess caloric, caloric intake and weight gain. So what they did is that they had two groups of people and they simply, the only difference was so their age matched and so on and so forth. They didn't match. They weren't isocaloric. They simply said this group is going to be less processed. You know, it wasn't completely whole foods, but less processed. And the others were highly processed. They even called it somewhat unprocessed in terms of the what I would call whole foods. But it was ultra processed and little processed. What they found is that in the course of the week, just on this difference, is that those who ate the processed food consumed on average about 500 calories per week more. So that means that basically, no, I'm sorry, it was 500 calories per day more. So that means in the course of the week, you'd have 3,500 more calories, and that's a pound a week in terms of fat, four pounds a month times 12, that's 50 pounds a year. And if you keep going, there's the multiplications on that. So that's pretty different. It's just on the processed versus not processed. Now, if you're a commercial company, you're sort of like throwing your hands up saying, yes, that's what we want. They're eating more of our stuff, you know, processed food, trickery, chemicals, additives, et cetera, works and makes people do more of that. We're hitting those right buttons. So perhaps I'm going over and over this, but I'm saying it's a really big issue. It's a vital issue. And it isn't something that is only treated at the level that I used to treat it at by simply saying, see this hamburger, see this, you know, eating it. And I'm trying to make it in a way that doesn't seem like I offend anybody. But when you're eating at McDonald's, yes, the meat patty, if you just had that, you could probably get away with it. But it's all the other stuff, the sesame seed stuff and this, that, and the other thing. And all the other crap that you're eating is one of the key reasons we now have the highest obesity we've ever had in the history of the world, the highest rates of diabetes we've ever had in the history of the world. Not that they've been dragging diabetes forever, but you can go back to the time of Hippocrates. So that's a good 500 years before BC, more or less. So the processed foods via these chemicals that have come in, that are added to our foods, knowingly, willingly, uh, scientifically arranged, tested, retested via the former tobacco companies, they're making a killing and they're killing a lot of people in the process of doing this. So there is a, a, a health danger for sure. 
So um, that was one study, and it's it's pretty interesting. It came up with that. So however you want to look at it, we, and then there are probably be subsequent studies. Now that this topic has been opened, you know, how does that affect you know chronic blood sugar levels? Your hemoglobin one AC. Uh, what about your inflammatory markers? You know, CRP. So you can put those things into it and track those as well. So it's a big big deal. The whole idea of understanding what ro- processed food is. And is not, it's just part of it. That's a little bit of cerebral. That's a little bit academic, I should say. A little academic, meaning it doesn't quite hit. It's not effective to leave it at that reference only. So because it's an addiction, because it's learned to turn off, these chemicals in processed food have learned to turn off the thinking part of the brain and turn on the craving part of the brain via dopaminergic pathways, is that you know, let me throw another example out there. You're walking by a bakery and, and you just love that particular kind of donut or you love the smell that comes into the bakery. You know, an addicted person wouldn't be able to walk by it, has to go in and get that. You know, and it's and it's all the self-talk that goes along with addiction. This is the non-thinking part of the brain, right? It's like, you know, why don't you just go get that? You love it. You deserve it. You know, do it. You know, life's too short. Just go do it. It's that whole encyclopedic number of just self-justifications you can give yourself. You know, discipline, discipline is just so overrated. Why be mean to yourself? You know, help yourself. Be be loving. We all should receive it loving, but this is the addicted mindset. It's the hijacking of the addicted mindset that goes in that. So how do you turn that back? Well, one is, all right, what's process? What's not process? All right, check that box. You got that down. But it's really self-awareness. And as you'll find in, in talking with Joan Iflin, you know, she's written books on this. You know, she is basically the, the master of what processed foods are. And she lines it right up with a DMS, a DMS A5 um, in terms of what are the, I think it's 11 criteria, maybe 12, 11 or 12 criteria for addiction. And she takes addiction, addiction, addi- food addiction right down to it. And she's written a number of papers on this as well. So it is addiction. And so how you treat addiction is by self-awareness, but it's also counseling people to remove themselves from those triggers. So let's go back to the donut. We'd say, you know, if it really is the case, you have to walk by this pastry shop on the way to work every day. Is there another way you could walk to work? So you don't see this visually and get visually stimulated. So you walk around those things. It's like an alcoholic. You don't say, well, let's see if we can get you to go in the bar and not have a drink. That's a very high bar, no pun intended, to have that person reach for. Wouldn't it be better to say, let's not have you go to a bar. Let's have you stay away from the environment in which there's a lot of alcohol. So we're not going to talk about, we're not going to talk to an alcoholic and saying, you know, I realize the solution is in your drinking issue is that you should just drink less. That never works. So for an addicted patient, person, client, you have to say, we're going to go without this thing you love. And so in order to do, to go without that, to begin in that direction, then we're going to go up and down is going to be progress and then regression and then progress again as is much of life that removing those visual cues those audio cues those cues on tv and so on and so forth so you the degree that you can reduce that exposure of those cues for that person around those things that that person is addicted to you will improve them dramatically. The other is having a daily exposure of people who are not addicted and talking to a group of people that either have graduated from addiction, of your addiction in particular. So you now are around like-minded people and are getting a support. And uh, Joan Iflin will talk about mirror neurons. Mirror neurons is that your tribe, you know, your tribe, you've now scaled up your tribe. You've now elevated the quality of your tribe in terms of the things that you need to work on. So if you want to give up alcohol, you hang around non-alcoholics. You hang around people that don't drink alcohol. 
and you remove that. Maybe you'll get to the point that you are so, you know, you've diminished this impulse and it takes months, if not years to do this, that you then can can go back into the bar and feel comfortable with that. I would say for most people, most of us that have an addiction, they would not go back into the den where that where everybody's having that addiction and be part of it. They would just walk around it and walk away from it. So that's part of it. So finding a group, and uh, Joan actually has a group online and realized that that's the, the most effective. All her research and everything else, thinking her book would have done it, and she even got involved with PBS uh, series once, that nope, they weren't effective. It's online, face-to-face, or in a room, better online, a little more intimate, actually, that these people get enough support and they hear it so they can step away, so they can step away from the addiction that they have and it gets less and less. So that impulse becomes less and less. And the part of the brain that was shut off starts to be exercised. You're opening the door to that. We're doing some thinking around a particular behavior. So to sort of summarize this, this idea of food addiction, primarily processed food addiction, is that our foods are so concentrated now that they've never been, never been, if you even go back 50 years, certainly if you go back 100 years or before that, they were just not that concentrated. The fruits today are far more concentrated. I mean, they've been developed. They're nothing like they were found two or 300 years ago. And obviously you go back before that in the millennia, thousands of years that we lived as humans and lived in a whole different world in which our our, our bi- biology evolved to adapt to. So in that world, no, things were not very intense at all. Okay, so we have the actual chemical structure of the food that makes it addictive. We have the behavioral aspect, which is an addictive personality. And they really need to be treated separately. So one is the manufacturers of said addictive foods need to change their practices. You know, there, there is a place to intervene. That's, you know, if they change their poisons, that would be great. But you as a person need to intervene on your own behalf and saying, I'm not, I'm not smoking anymore. It's just not a good thing. You're saying the same thing about processed food. I'm not process, eating processed foods anymore. It's that potent. So then the question is how? You identified it. That's a degree of self-awareness. You're now becoming aware of your particular behavior because you so self-justify the way that you need this, want this, deserve this, that it's very clear on your list. Now you have to avoid the triggers, you know, remove it from visual, audio, and whatever stimulus this provides to you. Just take it away. You feel a lot better. Um, speaking about dairy, you know, it was it was pretty obvious in our practice up through naturopathic medicine that pretty much every physician will a naturopathic physician will say, okay, let's just, you know, not do dairy, all cow milk products, and not do wheat. You can even go further and say not do gluten, but that's a larger list. We say, let's, we're not going to do wheat, so all the breads and everything else, we're not going to do that, and we're not going to do all cheese products for two months. And so what happens is the first week or so, it's probably most difficult because they have that impulse. They want to go get the ice cream which is more than just dairy, of course. They want to go get the cheese and so on. But second week, it's easier. Third week, it's easier. So what you find at the end of the two months is that they actually will say, I feel so much better. It's not so much they feel so much better that they don't have to have the dairy. They mean they feel so much better because their sleep has improved. Their their breathing has improved. Their vision has improved. So all the stuff that dairy sort of gunks up, how's that for a medical term, um, is no longer there. And your body has had enough time to process all the remnants to rid yourself of it for the most part. And it's been a tremendous difference. So that testimony, that event has happened thousands and thousands of thousands of times, certainly in our practice, my practice. And so I'm certain of that. And so what's the difference between wheat and and which is stronger, wheat or, or dairy? I would say they're pretty much Thai. I would tend to tip the scales a little more towards dairy. There's probably a little more studies on that, but both have a thing called 
uh, morphines, casomorphines. There you go again. It's a reference to an addictive drug, morphine, which comes from, um, well, heroin is there. It's a narcotic, but it it's referencing it because it hits the same receptors that uh, morphine and heroin hits. That's why they call it morphine. Casomorphine, glutamorphine. So that's what that's about. It's the addictive qualities of these particular two foods. Now, it's interesting. It was about 10,000 years ago, what they call the Fertile Crescent in, in Egypt, Iran, and Persia, and the Middle East, that agriculture, it was called the Fertile, well, the fertile Crescent. It was uh, the birthplace of agriculture. And so that's where these things started coming on, where dairy perhaps is a little older than, not by much, a little older than, than the cultivation of wheat, which, by the way, it's no longer like the wheat then of 10,000 years ago. Wheat has become much more concentrated and refined. So what we found, the before and after of, of wheat and dairy, is that you now have records. I mean, these, they, they exhumed various bodies and they found out it's like the average height of mankind, men and women, decreased. Um, their facial structures, their jaw got narrower and they had more teeth problems, arthritis uh, came into the play, which hadn't existed before. So just on those two things, and this is just sort of a beginning of the evolution of processed foods. And so we're an addictive foods and go forward to that. So it's dramatic and it's not nothing to speak incorrectly. So it's something there. So now we go way up to the future, up to the present. And we find things are so concentratedly addictive on purpose with full intention by lots of companies that it's almost hard, well, it is very hard to turn it around. It's certainly not going to be any sort of government intervention. I mean, the FDA has already approved all this stuff and will approve more because people don't die the first time they have this addictive food. They just get fatter or their uh, metabolic biomarkers start getting worse and worse. Inflammation autoimmune uh, complexes, et cetera, et cetera. And so that's the path it begins on. So I think you got the idea of what processed foods are. I think you got the idea it's not just an academic decision. It's a behavioral one. So when we hear behavioral, think back to Dr. Chris Palmer's talk, is that he dealt with behaviors and realized in changing the diet to a ketogenic diet, really changed a lot of that. I think we've talked a number of how it changes some of the other neurotransmitters to be more thoughtful. So I'm going to leave you with that. And that is the beginning of why when I talk with Joan, it's really so important. And you can directly connect this to the ketogenic diet. So in the ketogenic diet, what are we doing? We are taking away the carbs, which are highly addictive. So now we're taking away addictive food. We're bringing in fats. And we're not, in with time, we'll be an educated fat person, meaning a person who understands fat. And, and so we're producing ketones. And ketones gives us that, that sort of calm ability to reflect on our particular behavior and turn on the front part of our brain. That is a big deal. That is a big deal. So this directly treats that. So the ketogenic diet, once more, is just a step away in terms of connecting to processed foods, which is, for the most part, all about carbs. I mean, you can have processed fats, too. Think about all the other stuff that's put in there, and that, that gets into seed oils, seed fats, and trans fats, and stay away from those. But we're just focusing on the aspect of processed foods and processed foods addiction. So thanks for listening. This is keying it up for a really interesting conversation over a couple portions. We we talked at length and uh, had to close it because it was going to be all morning we're going to be talking. Um, some of the future topics coming on after that, we'll be going into fiber. Some of these uh, questions come up, but what about fiber and the whole idea that ketogenic diet doesn't give you enough fiber? Well, I'll let you think about that and we'll get to it. It'll be very, uh, very fulfilling. So look for the references on Dr. 
Joan Iflin and her work in the show notes of today's broadcast. And I look forward to hearing what you have to say. Bye-bye. Hi, this is Dr. Goldcamp. I thought I would take a moment of your time to tell you about something that we've been working on for a long time. And that is our product of C8 Keto MCT oil. How is it different and why would you even care about it? It's the highest purity you can find in the market, which is 99.7% caprylic acid triglyceride. And by the way, that's backed up by a certificate of analysis. It's not just me making up these numbers. But I think the bigger story behind our C8 MCT oil is not only that it is the most efficient way for you to create ketones naturally, and that is all three ketones, your beta-hydroxybutyrate, your acetoacetate, and your acetone. That's important. But the other part is it supports sustainably harvested palm oil. Why would you care? Because all the other C8 oil products out there, not the MCT oils, but the C8 MCT oils, some people call them ketogenic oils out there, they come from palm oil. And palm farming, specifically palm kernel farming in Southeast Asia, is decimating the rainforest there. Absolutely. You go on right now to Google or to YouTube and say palm oil Southeast Asia and you will be in tears at the end of 10 minutes when you see the destruction that's happening. This is not part of that. This is the exception. So it's called RSPO, Roundtable on Sustainable Palm Oil. You have to apply for it. You have to be audited by them. And it's a long, rigorous process. And it took us two years to bring this product to market. I hope you care. And I know you'll care about the efficiency in which it helps you make ketones. By the way, we don't drink this like it's a fluid. We put a little bit in our coffee. We make our mayonnaise out of it. We make uh, various salad dressings out of it when we have a salad. It's basically a, I hate to say crutch, but it's my aid to keeping me in ketosis when I want to be in ketosis. It's fast. It's long lasting, certainly long, longer lasting than exogenous ketones and much more holistic, as I mentioned, with all three ketones. That's about as much as I want to say. I hope you look into it. I hope you uh, take your ketones readings on a regular basis, as along with your glucose. If you do, then you really value this product. All the best, and I thought you should know.